Hello fellow travelers and hello fellow aviation enthusiasts. Today we're talking about Emirates and we're talking about a couple of things that have been quite harsh, could have been dealt with better. Uh, things that the media news outlets already spoke about but they did not dig into the details because they actually don't know people in Dubai that are passing through this moment and are living the nightmare of being fired and probably having outstanding debts towards the banks. So we're going to be digging deep into these details and trying to give you more of a human perspective of the problems that they're going through. This link in the upper right corner is our masterclass series on joining Emirates. Follow it from the beginning to the very end. We're going to be talking about reductions that are being applied to cabin crew and pilots, how much they actually make with these reductions applied. We're talking about fees that were originally applicable to cabin crew. So things that are on top of the reductions that the company is already applying. We'll be talking about how worth is it to be in Dubai. And we're also going to be talking about the investments that most crew are making, uh, whether it's a house or a business, what situation are they in now since they're losing their job. We'll also be talking about how hard it is to get into Emirates. What are the several stages that you have to go through in order for you to become part of the company. We'll also talk about the recently recruited cabin crew and pilots that were through their training and got sent back home with a seven day notice just because they were found redundant because there's no flights. And last but not least, we'll talk about the uh, way that the company dealt with the firings yesterday and this morning, which in my opinion and of the opinion of the people that got fired could have been dealt with better. Not so long ago, we released a video. It's called Emirates in Review. You can find the link in the upper right corner right now. It spoke about reductions, uh, redundancy of pilots and crew. It spoke about aircraft being decommissioned, all that stuff. I'm not going to repeat it right now, but if you're interested, watch that video. It's pretty good. On that video, we said that cabin crew were receiving a 25% reduction in their basic salary. But right now, since the 7th of June until September 2020, this reduction has been raised to 50%. So cabin crew are not making 75% of their basic salary. They are now making 50% of their basic salary. For a business class cabin crew member who's been for longer in the company, and since every year of completion in the company, you get a higher and higher and higher basic salary. So depending on how many years you've been in the company, you're gonna make a higher basic salary. They are now making 3000 dirhams per month. This is roughly an average for a business class cabin crew member, which is around 820 US dollars. If we apply the same 50% reduction to economy class cabin crew members, they earn 2000 dirhams per month, which is 550 US dollars. Now, nobody talks about it, but there are some fees that cabin crew have to pay when they join the company. Okay, some fees are for some benefits. You can renounce those benefits, but some fees are mandatory. And uh, one of these fees, which is quite quite of a big fee you will have a monthly deduction of 333 dirhams 90 us dollars every month for three years and then at the completion of your contract completion of those three years this money will be reverted back to you okay and this is sort of a motivational tool that the company uses for it to keep its employees for at least three years because they train them and they want that they want the insurance they want to be reassured that the, the employee won't leave by having that retention money. It's sort of a tool that keeps them in the company. But you have to think, uh, since economy cabin crew members are making 2000 dirhams per month because they're already getting paid less than other cabin crew members, they're the most juniors in the company, and they're getting this 333 dirham deduction. There are no flights, so they're not making any flying pay. And that's, I think, the biggest part of their salary and they're not going abroad to any layover, so they don't get any layover allowances. Some crew actually save up some money from their allowances and are able to pitch in with the expenses, pay utility bills or whatever with the allowances. So since all these things are not applicable for this period, this pandemic period, because Emirates is actually not flying, you have to stop and think, is 500 US dollars, 550 US dollars really worth it? Especially if you have those deductions because you're in the first three years and you're an economy cabin crew member. Is it really worth it? Let's let's just think this way. How much is home internet in Dubai? It's around, I wrote it down here, hold on, 110 US dollars for a basic, not luxury, basic home internet plan with TV. TV isn't included, it's just a console, you plug it into the TV and you got channels. How much is a mobile internet plan? It's, uh, I wrote it down here again, 55 US dollars. Now we're already at 165 US dollars per month just for internet and a mobile plan. Okay, 
Now if you want to go out for a pizza, how much does a pizza cost in a pizzeria? 70 dirhams, that's around 19 US dollars. A beer, 45 dirhams, I believe that's like 12 US dollars, 13 US dollars, something like that. So you see, it's expensive. When you go for groceries, you think it's going to be the same price as uh, in Europe or elsewhere, in Asia or... No, it's much more expensive because everything is imported. There's quite a few things that Emirates is actually growing themselves with greenhouses, but most of the food is being imported and the prices are higher. So it's really not easy to get through the month with 550 US dollars deductions applied. It's really, really hard. So if we do, for example, 550 US dollars and then you remove 90 US dollars from the retention money and then you remove the 110 US dollars for the internet, and then you remove 55 US dollars for the mobile plan, you're left with very, very little and you have to still uh, go and do groceries because you're in Dubai all your time and you still want to go out and lifestyle is expensive. So you have to stop and think, is it really worth it to stay in Dubai for that little money? I mean, is it maybe better to go back home and you get paid the same or maybe you get paid more or get paid triple? People have to stop and think and realize that um, there's other ways, it's not just Emirates. Emirates is an amazing company, great opportunities. I'm not pushing people to jump off of the boat, but they have to think that there's other paths. They got this job, it was really hard to get, but this is not the only thing in the world. There's so many other things that you can do. You just have to discover your skills and dig in that direction. And maybe that's gonna be the thing that your life pivots around. Most crew that are living in Dubai are away from their families. They are flying non-stop and nowadays not much, but they're flying non-stop and they barely see their friends. Uh, the people that they connected for so many years in their life, they're back home. So pretty much what I'm trying to say is that living in Dubai is sort of a sacrifice. Most of the times people that go uh, to Dubai and work for Emirates are there for three reasons. The number one reason that can come to my mind is they want to travel the world, they want to go to so many destinations that probably a regular person that doesn't do a job in the travel industry or aviation industry will never see in his whole lifetime. People have been like working as a flight attendant have been to more than 70 countries within three years. So nowadays, are you actually flying and traveling and visiting these places? Not really. And for how long is this going to continue? It's been since March. Now we're uh, in June. What's the passenger demand? Uh, how many cabin crew are there? So you have to share, you have to divide the amount of, of flights per every single cabin crew. And since there's many cabin crew, you're not going to see more than 10 or 20 hours flying time on your rosters. Maybe you'll reach 40 hours, but is that still sufficient to cover or make it worth it to stay in Dubai? You're not flying as much, so you're not visiting as much, and also your pay. You're there probably for the money. That's the second reason why you might be in Dubai, saving money to invest into a house, an apartment, or a project, or a, an investment of any nature. Are you able to do that? Not really. And for how many more months is it going to happen that you'll be earning a basic salary which has a 50% deduction on it, and you'll be flying very little, so there's very little flying pay. Another reason why Kevin crew are in Emirates working for Emirates is because Emirates is their dream. They want to be flight attendants. They want to be flight attendants for the best company in the world. And that's why they're in Emirates. So probably those people are not willing to give up, not willing to jump off the boat because the first two reasons are not the reason why they're in Emirates. The reason why they're in Emirates is because being in Emirates was their dream. So in that case, keep going, hold tight. This brings me to another point, talking about what type of cabin crew do we have in the company. We have cabin crew that are flying and using all their money in going out, partying, having fun. And there are cabin crew that are investing all their money into uh, projects that they have. For example, buying an apartment in their own home country or buying a hotel. There, there's actually some cabin crew pursers that I met and I flew with and they open hotels in Sri Lanka and they're investing all their money plus taking loans from the bank and putting it into that hotel, believing and working on the hotel while they're in Dubai. So not all crew are just flying from point A to point B and that's it. That's their life. That's it. No, they have projects. They have other things going on. They used all their savings for the project that they have. They took loans or mortgages 100% relying on the income that they were getting every single month. But now that they don't have that, how are they going to pay the debt back? They still have debts towards the bank. And what's going to happen? They have to pay those debts back. So this is extremely frustrating because 
most people got around, if I'm not mistaken, 30 days notice. I'm not entirely sure. It should be 30. You have to sell your car, sell your furniture, sort out the bank problem. You have to close your mobile plan. Your, probably there's some fees there if you didn't finish your plan, your 12 month cycle or 24 month cycle, depending on what you took. There's several things that you have to settle before you leave. And you have one month where your life completely flips from being a cabin crew to not being a cabin crew. It's uh, kind of tough to settle all those things. Some crew have families in Dubai. Some are single moms and some are single moms with loans. One month notice to clear everything and leave is not easy to do. There is no protection for the employee since unions do not exist. This is a stress that media news outlets are not talking about. And this is where we have to be as empathetic as possible and compassionate as possible. Emirates was recently conducting recruitments. They recruited cabin crew. They were in training college. They were probably almost through the whole training process. And then they were stopped and sent back home because they were found redundant. Not enough flights. We don't need you. Go back home. Okay, so you might think this is a regular strategy that any company has to do to stay afloat and survive. I totally get that, but if you think about it, let's talk about how hard it is to become a cabin crew. To become a cabin crew for Emirates, you have to first pass an Emirates interview. To get to the Emirates interview, you first have to be invited or you have to pass a digital interview or if you just sent your CV and you've been accepted, you still have to pass that. Once you show up, you have to pass all the phases, which are like at least three group exercises psychometric test, English test, a final interview with a recruiter. There's several steps and then it's not guaranteed that you're going to get picked. You still have to get a, a golden call. It's called the golden call. And uh, there's a lot of information. You can find more information in the link here in the upper right corner. But uh, just to let you know, there's a lot of phases that someone has to pass in order for them to become Emirates. And some people don't pass it at the very first shot. Those are the lucky ones. Some people they, it takes them around nine times to get in. I personally know someone that has been working for several years in first class uh, with Emirates and she applied nine times before she got the job in Emirates. And imagine that that person came from Brazil, from Sao Paulo. There's so much competition in Brazil. It's so hard to get through the Emirates interview in Brazil that probably that person said, you know what? I'm not going to apply in Brazil anymore. It's too hard. I'm going to save up some money, go to Rome and apply from there. So that person will go to Rome and travel thousands of kilometers, pass the Emirates interview, pass the CV drop off, pass all the, the, the group exercises, pass the psychometric test, English test, final interview and everything. And then she gets sent back home throughout half of her training after she was already buying furniture and super happy that she got the job. Imagine how frustrating that is. For some people, working for Emirates is a dream they would devote their entire life for. And now they're being sent back home after they were through half of the training. We need to stop and think of, of what they're feeling. We, ne we need to stop and think and understand what impact this had on their life. They probably uh, quit their job and nowadays it's really hard to find a job. It's, it's really, uh, it's really dramatic. If you think about it, maybe for you it's nothing because for you it's just someone losing their job. But getting in Emirates is so hard. It, they say that it's harder to get in Emirates rather than in Oxford or Cambridge. It's so hard to get in that the, the percentage of success is less than 1%. And if someone actually manages to get in and struggles so hard to get in and then throughout half of the training he's discontinued and sent back home, imagine how that person feels. Just very recently, 120 pilots that were through their training course, they got sent back home because they were found redundant. We don't have an exact number of how many ab initio crew, so crew that were freshly recruited and were doing their training course, were sent back home. We don't know how many, but all of them, they were sent back home. And just recently, Emirates started firing crew like crazy. It's been happening yesterday morning and it's happening right now as we speak. I'm not entirely sure. This is probably a rumor, nothing official, but 600 pilots have been found redundant and have been invited to a mandatory meeting in the Emirates Training College Building C and have been discontinued. They've been given around, I think, three months notice before they have to leave the company. So that's pilots. And same thing for cabin crew. A lot of them have been invited to mandatory meetings in, in the Emirates Training College Building C and are now being fired. Cabin crew that are getting called in are cabin crew that have various sickness incidents per year or cabin crew that have ongoing health conditions or that have some absence or low performance on board and hence received a warning. 
Now there's a procedure that Emirates uses and has in place for their warnings. The first warning that you get is a caution letter. After that, you get a verbal warning, then a written warning, and then uh, as a final stage, you get a final warning. And after that, if you keep on having this trend of getting warnings, you will get fired. So the people that were on a final warning, they all got called in and got discontinued. I don't exactly remember every single step of this procedure, but what I know is that most of the times you do get a warning because of low performance on board and the performance can be measured and established by cabin supervisors. Now, most of the cabin supervisors that we have on board are great. They do their job very well. It's a pleasure to work with and everything is pretty much professional. But then you have those uh, cabin supervisors that uh, are power thirsty. They uh, cannot disassociate uh, work from personal life. They bring their frustration on board and they take it down on the crew. So for some little small mistake, you can have a report that if added to another uh, report that you already had or maybe some some attendance issue or something from a caution letter you can end up having a final warning especially nowadays where cabin crew are redundant uh, you only need one report to have a final warning and if you get a final warning then it's it's dismissal so what i want to put emphasis here on is that Maybe one year ago, you got a final warning for some cabin supervisor that said, eh, it's just, it's just a report. Nothing's gonna happen. He's gonna survive. It's gonna be fine. But because of this pandemic now, the actions of that cabin supervisors, the superficial actions of that supervisor are now impacting that much that this cabin crew now is getting fired because of you. Maybe, and hopefully from now on, cabin supervisors and pursers, all cabin crew are more close to each other, support each other, and think twice before doing something to sort things out on the aircraft and once you land everything is sorted out and there's no need to get in touch with the manager and escalate everything. This is the, the pivotal part of the video. I was saying that things could have been dealt with better for the fact that cabin crew were sent in, they were assigned to several rooms with their manager. They walked in, they were explained why they were being fired, escorted by security. Security was put in place just to prevent any escalation, any confrontation, you know, physical confrontation of the cabin crew being upset. When I resigned, I got a cake, I had my last flight, the crew were amazing. They got me a gift. I still have the gift here. If I find it, I'll show it to you. It was a, a super beautiful farewell. But uh, the way people are being fired now, not only they're losing their job, not only they have outstanding debts with their banks or any project that is unfinished and they have to finish uh, one way or another uh, through finding another job and the difficulties of finding another job, but they don't even get I don't know, like a, a document saying uh, thank you for the years of service, a reference or uh, something like that can really be of good value for the next job they have to look for. In my opinion, someone that works for you for seven, eight, I don't know how many years, I'm quite sure that there's people that work for 15 years or even more. I feel that this could have been handled better. When Emirates hires you, they teach you to strive for the same values that they strive for. Pioneering, innovative, visionary, cosmopolitan, and empathetic. I will leave this to you to comment down in the comment section. Okay, so now let's talk about the good things. Emirates will be soon resuming some flights up to 26 destinations. If I am not mistaken, uh, from June 11th, uh, they will be flying to London, Heathrow, Frankfurt, Paris, Milan, Madrid, Chicago, Toronto, Sydney, Melbourne, and Manila. And they recently added a new update from uh, Monday, June 15th. They will fly to Bahrain, Manchester, Zurich, Vienna, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Dublin, New York, JFK, Seoul, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Jakarta, Taipei, Hong Kong, Perth, and Brisbane. So things will get better. Definitely will get better. New routes will be uh, put in place, new flights, new destinations. Passenger demand will go up. We know that airlines will go, will follow the trend with inertia. They will take baby steps. I'm not just gonna buy a lot of aircrafts and put new routes if passenger demands doesn't go up and stay stable. We're quite sure that cabin crew will not have a lot of hours, not a lot of flying pay. It's gonna be still hard, but it's gonna get better and gradually, gradually, gradually increase. Anyways, that is the end of this video. Um, I think that these recent updates have been really, really drastic, but uh, Emirates has to survive and uh, and then later thrive. A lot of companies will go out of business. Emirates probably will be one of the lucky ones that 
are still in the aviation industry in the business and are able to purchase other companies and uh, are able to to buy the slots from other airports and we don't know if it's they're gonna monopolize but for sure i'm quite sure that emirates is gonna thrive and uh, and grow stronger than ever and we don't know if it's gonna rehire the people that they fired definitely they're gonna hire a lot of people in the coming years as things get better and better if you like this video and you found it useful hit the like button and subscribe uh, it really helps us out we thank you for watching uh, we love your support and that's it. I gotta say, I'm quite upset from these recent changes. I know people in Dubai. Uh, I'm not working in Dubai, but I feel affected because I know some of my friends lost a job and uh, it's not looking good. Anyways, that's it. I talk too much. See you on the next one. Orlando signing out. See ya.